Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks for the introduction. I hope you can hear me despite the siren in the background. So this afternoon, I'm going to be discussing candidemia and invasive candidiasis. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, because as I mentioned to you earlier, it's always nice for me to survey the literature and um, get an update myself. So this is, this is really always nice. So this slide just summarizes what I want to cover in the next um, 45 minutes or so. Um, just revise some taxonomy, um, discuss the pathogenesis of candidemia and invasive candidiasis, discuss some of the main clinical syndromes, um, and also talk briefly about the epidemiology in South Africa. I also want to talk about the laboratory diagnosis and clinical management. So let's start immediately with um, taxonomy. So the International Code of Nomenclature for Algae, Fungi, and Plants governs the, the taxonomy of, of uh, fungi. And in 2011, at the Melbourne Convention, um, this rule was adopted, or this principle was adopted, that one fungus had to have one name. Um, you would think that was obvious, but um, as mycologies evolved over time, um, fungi, as you know, are polymorphic, so they have multiple forms, and the different forms of fungi have been given different names. So prior to 2011, the teleomorph name, the, the sexual form, uh, was given precedence, but following this um, convention in 2011, the rule is now that every taxonomic group um, can only bear one correct name, which is the earliest name. The problem is, you know, one fungus, which name do you use? And especially with the recent adoption of molecular approaches, which has really led to profound shifts in fungal nomenclature and taxonomy as the correct taxonomic relationships and affiliations are now being recognized. So let's briefly look at how this is going to affect candida. So candida can be known or could be known as the dustbin genus because really the genus is heterog heterogeneous and clearly polyphyletic, which means that um, the species within the genus are genetically distantly related. Currently, they're in excess of 200 species and 13 teleomorph genera. Uh, but as you all know, there's six major pathogens for the vast majority of infections, albicans, parapsilosis, glabrata, aurus tropicalis, and cruzii. So based on use of molecular approaches, um, two of the major pathogens have recently been renamed. Um, so there's Candida glabrata, which has been renamed Acacia myces glabrata, and then Candida cruzii, now, uh, now known as Pitchia cudria bzevii. Um, and there are, are, you know, some, some of these other um, species here um, have also been put into various other genera. So, Andy Borman and Liz Johnson, who wrote this review in Jaclyn Micro last year, um, justified you know, using these new names in clinical practice uh, by pointing out that the revised taxonomy uh, that reflects these correct phylogenetic relationships actually correlate better with unusual antifungal resistance profiles observed with many of the less common species of pathogen, uh, pathogenic yeasts. For example, uh, the yeast that was formerly Candida cruzii um, would be unusual. You know, it's Candida cruzii we know is usually resistant to fluconazole and fucytosine. And so that's very unusual when you compare to other Candida species, but it's a feature shared by many of the Pitchia species. The Pitchia could you have Zevia is actually a better name for this fungus. So what do you do in the micro lab? Um, you would report 
the name, the new name, and then the old name in parentheses. And so in this way, um, you'd be using the correct uh, taxonomic designation, and then also making sure that clinicians are not confused, uh, because these are obviously very um, well-recognized names. Okay, so I'm gonna move now on to pathogenesis. So invasive disease caused by candida requires firstly an increased fungal burden. Secondly, some sort of alteration of the skin and mucosal surface. And then often uh, these two um, problems are amplified by the presence of prosthetic material, IV catheters, urine catheters, et cetera, and candida forms biofilms on, on this prosthetic material. So from a gastrointestinal source point of view, candida albicans and acasiomyces clavrata um, have are endogenous fungi. So they're resident in the gastro, gastrointestinal tract. Whereas candida auris, candida papsulosis can also be found in the GIT, but are often found colonizing the skin. And then in terms of the genitor urinary tract, candida albicans, and sometimes candida auris. So it really depends on the, on the species to, to, to you know, it, that, that often gives you an idea of where this fungus is coming from. So these are well-known risk factors for invasive candidiasis. In this review, um, these risk factors are subdivided into three groups. So people who are immunocompromised and by immunocompromised, I think they're mostly um, referring to people with problems with their innate immune system. And then those are, and then you've got a large group of people who are non-immunocompromised who are still at risk for candidemia and invasive candidiasis, and then separately neonates. And these other, these, these factors within each host group um, summarize the, the major, um, additional risk factors that, that these uh, people can actually have, which then um, amplify their risk for invasive candidiasis. So knowing the origin of the pathogens causing bloodstream infections is, is in critically ill patients is crucial. So this study is really beautiful. It was published last year in Nature Medicine um, and I'm going to take you through, this is one patient. Um, this is a person who had a hemopoietic stem cell transplant, and the green vertical line indicates the day of this person's um, stem cell transplant. Um, so what you can see in the very, at the very top of this um, figure is antifungal treatment. Um, the next row shows you the neutrophil, the absolute neutrophil count. And so you can see that it was above a threshold of 0.5 and then drops to below 0.5. Um, the next row indicates um, bloodstream infection with uh, candida. And so you can see that on day 12 and 13, this patient had uh, candida parapsilosis isolated. And then the next blocks indicate the relative abundance and the absolute abundance of different candida species in the gut of this patient. So this was a microbiome study um, showing the relationship between intestinal fungi and candida bloodstream infections in this group of patients with uh, bone marrow transplants. Um, and then right at the bottom, you see also the fecal strains. So what you can see for this particular patient is that using this microbiome analysis, these investigators were able to demonstrate that positive blood cultures were preceded by increases in the relative abundance of a single candida species. So this, um, this cross-hatching, not cross-hatching, this um, diagonal hatching, um, this pattern indicates this particular um, strain of candida parapsilosis. And you can see that 
prior to this isolation in blood, the relative abundance of candida papulosis in the gut increased. And also they found in phylogenetic analysis that candida species isolated from blood cultures were then identical to the isolates that dominated the intestinal microbiome. And they also were able to validate the protective effect of a really diverse bacterial microbiome. Um, so giving antibiotics um, would of course then um, reduce that diversity and increase the risk of um, candida infections, invasive candida infections. So this is what happens at the system level, the organ level, um, so at the gastrointestinal tract level. So the question next is, what happens at a cellular level? How, does the, how do these candida yeasts indicated here at the epithelial surface get from, from the epithelial surface to you know, cross these barriers into the bloodstream? So of course they can get a fast track route because we often put in IV catheters. Um, GIT surgery of course will damage the mucosal barriers. Chemotherapy related mucositis will do the same. But you can also see that candida doesn't need any of this. Candida albicans in particular has multiple um, virulence factors that allow the organism to either invade through the epithelial barrier or it can induce endocytosis. And so it'll, it can pass through the epithelial barrier, um, get into the, the tissues, the sub-epithelial tissue. Um, you can then see that the, um, the effector cells initially respond um, the epithelial cells produce defensins, recruit phagocytes. Um, candida then, then encounters all these resident macrophages. The neutrophils are then recruited. Uh, they produce uh, reactive oxygen species. They also produce these nets, which are neutrophil extracellular traps. They recruit um, monocytes, natural killer cells. But despite all this, Candida can still get past um, and then breach the endothelium. Um, and within the, the bloodstream, of course, uh, they need to avoid all the innate um, immune cells, the neutrophils, the monocytes, um, the natural killer cells, and of course, the, the platelets in, the, in this case too. So from a... From a um, immunology point of view, just remember that the immune system at a cellular level is not recognizing the yeast cells, but really these pathogen associated molecular patterns. This is a cartoon of the candida albicam cell envelope. And what you can see is the membrane, uh, transmembrane proteins. And then you can see that the, the cell wall is really comprised of chitin, glucans, and mannans. And these are the pathogen associated molecular patterns that the immune cell recognizes, the immune cells recognize. And so these PAMPs are recognized by cells with pattern, pattern recognition receptors. And these cells include monocytes, macrophages, neutrophils, and dendritic cells. And so each of the different fungal PAMPs is recognized by a slightly different pathogen recognition receptor. So for instance, um, the C-type lectins like Dectin-1 recognize beta-glucan. And as a consequence of this recognition, set off a whole pro-inflammatory cytokine cascade, which then of course leads to that effector response that we saw here. Candida of course is um, really wily and as a host of um, virulence factors and mechanisms to evade the host immune system. So for instance, it can shield all its PAMPs, its pathogen associated molecular patterns. So it transitions to the hyphal form when it's invading tissue so that the mannans can shield the beta-glucans from, um, from the outside. 
and so the immune cells don't recognize the beta glucans. They can also, candida can also inhibit macrophage activity, um, which uh, through the, and, and it, it does this by inhibiting phaga lysosome maturation and production of nitric oxide. It can also induce a switch from one macrophage phenotype to less inflammatory uh, macrophage phenotype and can also hijack some of the PRR pathways or the pathogen recognition uh, receptor pathways. So for instance, it can activate the toll-like receptor 2 to dampen the immune system through Tregs and tolerogenic uh, dendritic cells. So there are some potential host immune genes that may actually increase susceptibility to candidemia. Based on a genome-wide association study, several genes listed here have been associated with um, increased susceptibility to, to candidemia. And most of these um, genes um, encode for um, you know, these, these various um, uh, code for various uh, pathways along these, uh, these immune pathways I've just outlined. So in terms of clinical syndromes, most of us are familiar with candidemia, but um, there's a lot more to candidemia than just a positive blood culture. So invasive candidiasis is the overarching term Candidemia, of course, means a positive blood culture um, or bloodstream infection. This accounts for uh, more than 50% of all cases in epidemiological studies and clinical trials. And that makes sense because a positive blood culture um, is you know, it's easy to define. Um, attributable mortality with candidemia is around 15 to 20%. Then you've got the syndrome known as acute disseminated candidiasis, which usually occurs in people with neutropenia, which is caused by myeloblative chemotherapy. Um, these people usually have a bloodstream infection with candida plus a characteristic hemorrhagic and papular rash, which is consistent with small vessel vasculitis. And they may also have multiple organ involvement. Uh, Another syndrome is chronic disseminated candidiasis, and this occurs when people recover from neutropenia caused by chemotherapy. And so on recovery, they develop a low-grade fever, right upper quadrant pain, which is often associated with a tender liver, um, splenomegaly, and increased ALP levels. Um, and if you do imaging studies, you'll find multiple focal abnormalities in the liver, spleen, kidneys, and sometimes the lungs. And these lesions really develop following neutrophil recovery, which it suggests that really you need an adequate host immune system um, to actually see these lesions radio radiologically. Sometimes you get a positive blood culture, but sometimes you may need to do a liver biopsy. Neonatal candidiasis, um, is an entity in itself because bloodstream infection occurs often with meningoencephalitis. Um, and CSF parameters, which are completely normal, may not exclude meningitis. So when I say CSF parameters, I mean uh, the biochemistry and the cell counts. Endothelmitis um, is usually endogenous and follows bloodstream infections and has been described to occur between in about 5 to 15% of people. Endovascular infection is usually um, endocarditis, but sometimes infection of intracardiac devices and usually occurs in people with persistently positive blood cultures. And then of course, new, uh, when they've got fever plus new murmurs, cardiac failure. And candida endocarditis characterized by a large emboli with thromboembolic phenomena. And then lastly, vertebral osteomyelitis is often, or not often, is sometimes recognized um, several months after unrecognized or 
inadequately treated candidemia. And patients usually present with progressive back pain. Um, and this diagnosis is usually only made um, once a biopsy is done or at, at the time of surgery when uh, pus is collected and the tissue uh, or the, you know, the material is cultured. Then of course, you've got intra-abdominal candidiasis, which is a whole other syndrome that I'm not really gonna go into. Um, but, but you do need a compatible clinical syndrome. Some of the syndromes are listed, shown on this, um, on this graph here, this Kaplan-Meier survival um, curve. So what you need to make a diagnosis is isolation of candida from a sterile site specimen, abdominal fluid or um, tissue, and usually positive non-culture diagnostics. So let's move on to the epidemiology in South Africa. And now when I talk about epidemiology, it's really going to focus on the, um, the syndrome of candidemia because as I've mentioned, that's really um, the syndrome that's easiest to, to delineate and define. So the last time we did national surveillance for candidemia was in 2016 and 2017. Um, we did a national laboratory-based survey, um, both in the public sector and the private sector. And we asked all laboratories to send, to report cases and send us the isolates. Um, we also then calculated the incidence risk of candidemia for hospitals for which we were able to find admission den denominators. And so you can see here that if you look at the incidence risk for the public sector, the most common pathogen causing candidemia is candida albicans, followed by parapsilosis, glabrata, um, and then fourth, you know, after the, the sort of agglomeration of other candida species is, uh, is um, auris which at the time, was, that's almost four or five years ago now, um, was emerging as a major pathogen. Um, and in contrast, in the private sector, you can see the epidemiology is different. Um, uh, Parapsilosis dominates, followed then by Candida auris and Albicans. So a very different picture in the private sector. A couple of years ago, the US CDC outlined some um, pathogens, which they considered public health threats requiring urgent and aggressive action. And you can see that among these, Candidaurus was listed. Candidaurus, from that same um, survey that we um, conducted in 2016 2017, um, we, we mapped the cases uh, from a spatial point of view and found that most cases of candidemia were diagnosed at that time in um, Gauteng province. But I think five years down the line, or four or five years down the line, things have certainly changed. And um, even though Gauteng, Gauteng remains the epicenter, um, other provinces are now certainly seeing many more cases of candidemia. Um, we summarized some of the demographic and clinical characteristics of patients with candida or candidemia. Um, in general, I, you know, patients in the private sector were somewhat older than those in the public sector. Um, and in fact, in more recent years, candida or unfortunately has spread into neonatal units, which I think is really unfortunate and is now occupying a niche that was previously occupied only by candida parapsilosis. Um, you can also see that in general, these patients had been admitted to hospital for several weeks before the first positive culture of candida auris. Um, they had previous hospital admissions, sometimes ICU admissions in the past. They tended to be um, you know, multiple interventions, mechanically ventilated, CBCs in place, TPN, um, and also would have received prior antifungal treatment. You can see in general that the, 
the crude mortality is fairly high um, in the public sector, around 37%, in the private sector, around 56%. But that, of course, is crude mortality and does not adjust for, um, for underlying factors, for instance. As I mentioned to you, the attributable mortality um, in general for candidemia is thought to be between 15 to 20 percent so what's the poor prognostic factors for candidemia? Um, some of these include a confirmed or presumed GI source versus a skin source, um, lack of source control. Um, and that, of course, makes sense, because if you don't uh, sort out the source, um, antifungal treatment's really not going to make much difference. Shorter time to positivity of blood cultures as a proxy for the amount of um, the quantity of candida in the blood. It's a very crude indicator though. Inappropriate delayed antifungal treatment, lack of consultation with an ID physician, and I'll pick this up a bit later again. Um, of course, severe sepsis or septic shock, and also severity of underlying comorbid conditions. And then a new risk factor for mortality, which we've just described, is HIV. So in this analysis, um, we looked at over just over a thousand people with candidemia. Um, the prevalence in the in this in this um, in this cohort was 41 percent, and 75 percent of people were of people who were HIV positive were ART experienced, with a median CD4 count of about 133. The overall mortality was 44 percent in this cohort. 37% among people who were HIV negative and 54% among those who were HIV positive. After adjusting for all possible confounding um, or confounding that we were able to adjust for, um, we found that the, in, the, the odds of death were still 1.8 uh, times higher in HIV seropositive people compared to those who were HIV seronegative. We also did a dose response analysis. And so compared to people who are HIV negative, those HIV positive and a CD4 count more than 200 had a 1.9 1, 1 times higher mortality. And those with a CD4 count below 200 had a 2.2 uh, times higher mortality. So some of the reasons we considered for, for this, um, for this um, phenomenon being observed was really that people with advanced HIV disease may have neutrophil defects or neutropenia. Many of the people in this cohort had evidence of HIV wasting, and they also may have had other opportunistic infections, including crypto, PCP, and TB, which may have contributed to their mortality in hospital. Not being admitted to ICU is potentially something else. Um, but what we did is a stratified an analysis to look for effect modification. And we saw that this effect of HIV was much weaker among people who were admitted to um, ICU, which suggests conversely then that ad admission to ICU may actually um, improve outcomes for people who are HIV positive. So let's move on to laboratory diagnosis now. So I mentioned these syndromes earlier, and the syndromes highlighted in red are those where you often find a positive blood culture. So that would be your first port of call. Um, chronic disseminated candidiasis is a plus or minus. You may not always find a positive blood culture, and so, as I mentioned, it's worth uh, doing a biopsy if you suspect this diagnosis. Um, with vertebral osteomyelitis, as I also mentioned, blood cultures are usually not positive, and so you need to then go ahead and um, go to the source of the infection um, and try to make a diagnosis using tissue or pus. So let's talk about an approach to diagnosis of candidemia. Um, the first question you should ask is, what is the pretest probability of candidemia in the patient who's in front of you? And this really depends on individual risk factors, 
whether the person's got signs and symptoms of infection, whether there are other general blood markers of infection, elevated CRP, for instance, um, procalcitonin, um, white cell count, platelets, et cetera. Um, also radiology, and then risk scores, which are adjusted for your setting. So this table summarizes um, some of the risk scores that have been proposed. Um, and some of you may be familiar with this colonization index, which was based on a single ICU um, study with 29 people. So the colonization index was really the number of positive sites over the number of cultured sites with a threshold of 0.5. Um, the candidate score is also well known, derived from 73 Spanish ICUs, 16,000 people, and derived score, the score is obviously derived from the multivariable logistic regression analysis. Um, in general, these scores have good negative predictive values, but poor positive predictive values in general. And they may not perform as well outside these derivation cohorts. So if it was, you know, if these, this candidate score was derived from a Spanish ICU cohort, then it may not um, have applicability to a South African high care unit setting, for instance. So, so that's the first thing you consider, your pretest probability. Um, the next thing is to obviously then submit high volume blood cultures prior to starting treatment. And this is of course the gold standard uh, for diagnosis. But as we know, the sensitivity is relatively low and is only around 50% when compared to um, autopsy, obviously an autopsy series. So the other problem with blood cultures is that there's a delayed time to positivity Positive blood cultures may flag only after one to seven days. Um, you'll get a gram stain, as you know, on the same day, but culture and then identification will take another one or two days and conventional susceptibility testing another one to two days. So by the time you know what the um, antifungal susceptibility results are, you're probably you know, a week down the line. So obviously, Diagnostics have tried to improve, you know, people have tried to improve this, this, this stream. So you may have heard of the yeast traffic light PNA fish system. Um, this is a peptide nucleic acid fluorescent in situ hybridization technique. Um, essentially what happens is you need a positive blood culture. So you still need to wait for the blood culture to flag positive. But once that's positive, instead of doing a gram stain, what you do is you heat fix a drop of blood on a glass slide, you fix it, you then add a drop of the probe, you incubate for 30 minutes at 55 degrees Celsius, and then you wash, and then you view under a fluorescent microscope. Um, green means candida albicans or parapsilosis, yellow means tropicalis, and red means glabrata, um, or cruzii. So they've sort of split it into what they considered susceptible, um, intermediately susceptible and resistant, I suppose, to the azoles. Of course, that doesn't, you know, that sort of traffic light system doesn't work in the South African setting because our parapsilosis is azole resistant. Um, we tend not to see much cruzii. Um, Anyway, so, but it's still useful because it gives you, it gives you an ID fairly quickly. Um, another option, of course, is then to use MALDI-TOF identification. Once you've got a positive um, blood culture and you've subcultured onto um, agar media, what you can then do is, once you've got something growing, you can then identify this using a MALDI-TOF instrument, and that'll give you an, you know, an answer in um, you know, under an hour if you have this on site. The other option, of course, is to then order 
a non-culture-based diagnostic test, if the pretest probability is reasonably high, and if that test would then increase the probability above the threshold for treatment, let's say, for instance, um, your threshold for treatment is 15 to 30%. Just be careful with these non culture based diagnostic tests because they're not perfect by any means. Does anyone know what the somewhat macabre procedure is? This is um, this is blood, if you can actually believe it. Lauren, I believe you may want to guess. <laughs> yeah, I was I was like, yes, it's my horseshoe crabs. Shame. Yes, it's the horseshoe crabs. <laughs> Excellent. Very good. Um, so horseshoe crab blood is bright blue. And it contains immune cells which are really exceptionally sensitive to bacteria. And when these cells meet bacteria, they clot around the bacteria and protect the rest of the horseshoe crab's body from toxins. So these blood cells have been used to develop a test called the Limulus amoebocyte lysate assay. And it's usually used to check new vaccines for bacterial contamination. So these poor horseshoe crabs are in great demand. Um, and I think they actually might be endangered as a consequence. But they're also used, as it turns out, in the beta-glucan assay. Um, beta-glucan, as I've mentioned earlier, is a part of the fungal cell wall, and it's certainly part of the candida cell wall. And so it's released as a soluble form during cell growth, mainly as triple helices. Um, the, the first step in the beta-glucan assay is to pretreat these triple helices um, with an alkaline reagent and then um, convert them to monomers. The next steps then rely on the clotting cascade in the limulus polyphemus or the horseshoe crab's blood. Um, beta glucan binds to factor G and activates it. Activ activated factor G then activates the clotting enzyme. And that clotting enzyme then converts the colorless compound to yellow, which is then measured by a spectrophotometer, even giving you an indirect measure of beta glucan levels in the blood. So, how useful is the beta glucan assay to, to rule out candidemia? Um, you can see that the pore sensitivity and specificity is around 80%. Um, as you'd expect, the positive predictive value increases. Uh, with increasing prevalence. So if you've got a 2% prevalence, uh, the positive predictive value is 9%. But if it's if the prevalence is 30%, you know, in the scenario where you've got a symptomatic patient with su suspected infection, then the PPV will be as maybe as high as 60%. Um, and also as you as you see, as the prevalence increases, the negative predictive value decreases, but not by not by much. So it's it's a much better rule out test than it is a rule in test. Um, although it's positive predictive value does improve as the prevalence increases and it depends on the setting in which you're using this assay. You can also take whole blood and if you have a lot of money, run the T2 MR assay. And so essentially what the T2 MR assay does is it lyses blood cells um, and then concentrates candida cells. Um, it then lyses the candida cells and then um, uses a PCR step to amplify the, the, the candida DNA. The DNA target then hybridizes to these capture probes. So the DNA is in the, in the green here and it hybridizes to those capture probes and you then get this, these interparticle linkages and then you get a change in the magnetic resonance, which is, which is then measured as agglomeration occurs. Um, so it's, it's a very fancy instrument. I'm not aware that any lab in South Africa uses this, um, although I might be wrong. I'm not certain if anything's changed. The turnaround time is five hours. You can obviously target the five common species um, in three groups, Candida albicans and Tropicalis, Parapsilosis and, can and Glabrata and Cruzia. It's got a very low limit of detection, one CFU per mole of blood, and there's a new 
research use only Candida auris assay, which could also be used in skin surveillance samples or colonization surveys. Um, the sensitivity is much, much better than blood culture. Uh, I'm sorry, not than blood culture, than the beta glucan assay or than PCR. Um, and the specificity is also excellent. And as you can imagine, again, the PPB increases with increasing prevalence and the negative predictive value remains extremely high. So it's a really good rule out test. And depending on the scenario you're using it in um, is a really useful rule in test too. Um, but I think cost is, is a major issue. And I don't think, as I mentioned, any labs are really using this. PCR is, an, is another method um, there are two commercial assays, the Roche SeptiFast and the Biofilm Film Array. Um, PCR is not more sensitive than blood culture, uh, but it does reduce the turnaround time. And here is the sensitivity and specificity for PCR with some of these commercial assays. I think this may be for SeptiFast. Okay, so the last section um, to move on to is management. So the first question you generally ask is, you know, what's the efficacy of these antifungal agents? And there've been a whole host of clinical trials that have been done focused mostly on patients with candemia, as I mentioned before, because candemia is easy to define. So in the 1990s, uh, most of the trials were comparing fluconazole to amphotericin B and found mostly equivalents. Um, possibly showing one trial in the 19, um, early 2000s, possibly showing that combination treatment may be better than fluconazole. But I don't think that was a very good study, actually. Um, then as the Kanakandans were launched, um, the Kanakandans and some of the newer azoles compared to the previous gold standard of amphotericin B, um, mycofungin, caspofungin, you know, apples, apples. Um, and then, you know, more studies showing that all these agents are really much the same. Um, Isabuconazole actually in the 2018 active trial didn't actually demonstrate, you know, wasn't, wasn't able to show non-inferiority of Isabuconazole to Casperfungin for primary treatment of invasive candidiasis. So that's the only one that's probably not going to be used for treatment. Um, uh, a patient level um, meta-analysis that was done about 10 years ago now, including seven randomized trials and about 2,000 cases of candidemia, showed that the kind of candid treatment was one of the main predictors of improved um, outcome. Removal of the central venous catheter in this analysis was also associated with improved outcome. So, Really, you know, for treatment of candidemia and invasive candidiasis, there's a whole bundle of, um, of care that should be offered. You need early treatment, generally within a minimum of 72 hours after the positive blood culture, but ideally even before that. Um, the kind of candens ideally should be used in septic shock. They should be early source control, um, so within 72 hours. Um, Follow-up blood culture is important. So, you know, the IDSA guidelines recommend blood cultures every 48 hours after starting antifungal treatment and until clearance of candidemia. Um, doing fundoscopy for everyone is reasonable, especially with a high prevalence. Um, obviously, you only do an echo for high-risk patients, particularly those with, um, with, you know, hardware in place or people who have persistent positive blood cultures. De-escalation is obviously important when, as soon as you've got susceptibility results and you should treat for an adequate duration of time. I mean, they know, you know, they know there's no real evidence for the duration of treatment, but all the clinical trials use 14 days. Um, I, I don't know if it's since the last positive as mentioned on this slide or, you know, from the, the last negative. I, I can never remember what the IDSA guidelines say. 
And I think the clinical trials have used slightly different definitions over the years. Certainly you should be calling infectious diseases. Um, this um, study done, I think it was a single center study that was done, uh, published a couple of years ago, um, compared about 775 to just over 900 patients. Those who were who had an ID consult versus no ID consult, and ID consult was associated with a 19% survival um, benefit. Um, and that was driven by the fact that in general, those who had an ID consult were more likely to adhere to evidence-based practices. So, you know, giving antifungal treatment, having um, fundoscopy, echo where indicated, central line removal, and also appropriate duration of antifungal treatment. What about treatment of um, resistant bugs? I, when I spoke to you last year, we talked about some of the drugs in the pipeline. I talked to you about um, some of the novel echinocandin. So resifungin is a next generation echinocandin. It's a structural analog of anidular fungin and has a really long half-life. So you can actually give it weekly. Um, so strive, was a phase two study that was published in CID last year um, and compared resifungin given once weekly um, to caspofungin. And the primary endpoint was 14 days overall cure, which was sort of a composite endpoint of mycological eradication plus clinical resolution. This was a phase two study, so um, powered for, for safety, not efficacy. Um, there were only 207 people enrolled into the study, um, and they found that in general, resifungin was, you know, had similar safety and efficacy to caspofungin. Um, shown on this Captain Meyer um, curve is really the secondary endpoint of time to negative blood cultures, which I think was around three weeks or so for both, for all three arms. There were two doses in the resifungin groups. There's a phase three study that's underway um, called Restore, and I'm not certain when that's going to be complete. It was meant to have completed in 2020 last year, but I think COVID's put a spanner in that works. Um, Ibrexafungib um, is, belongs to the triterpenoid class. It's very similar to the kind of candens, but it's somewhat structurally different and interacts differently with um, beta uh, glucan synthase. It's an oral and an IV agent. And so, you know, it could be useful for, um, it could be useful for, for long-term treatment, but also useful for multi-drug resistant pathogens. So it's, it's being explored in several settings, but also for candida oris infection. And then there's FOS manager picks uh, or manager picks, which has a completely novel action. It sort of, um, it targets this GWT1, um, which is essential for tracking these manoproteins to the surface of cells. So this is what, you know, these red things should be trafficked to the surface. And with, with manager picks, this is what happens. Uh, none of these manoproteins are expressed, and it, it's really not good for the fungal cell. Um, so they've got phase two study, a phase two study, which is, um, I think, underway, should, should have been completed, and I'm fairly sure it's going to be, it'll be published sometime this year, and they're now planning a, a phase three study. So I think, you know, um, manager picks is another interesting agent to look out for. And then, of course, there's 5FC, which is, um, you know, a good old, um, of patent, though yet unregistered agent in South Africa, um, but it could be used in combination with amphotericin B, for instance, as we use it for cryptococcal meningitis. Um, and I know that there are some research groups interested in looking at the combination of amphot B and 5FC as a combination. So just in summary, um, there've been recent nomenclature updates for two of the major human pathogens, Trying to remember um, what those names are. They're not the easiest. They don't roll off the tongue really well. Um, but there's Pitchia and uh, there's Nicasiomyces. 
So candidemia is overrepresented in surveillance and clinical trials, but as I've mentioned to you, it's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of invasive candidiasis. We know that azole-resistant pathogens, both parapsilosis, um, Oris, and also Candida cruzia to some extent have found a niche in South African hospitals. I've shown you new data that HIV is an independent risk factor in hospital mortality among people with candidemia. And you should be using conventional diagnostics always and non-culture diagnostics judiciously. So use them cautiously. They are useful. Evidence-based bundles of care um, should be facilitated by infectious diseases and will improve outcomes. And all these new agents in the pipeline I've mentioned will definitely take time to get to South Africa. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Nilesh. That was really brilliant. Um, for, for those who want to ask Nilesh a question, just type it into the chat box or, or else raise your, raise your hand. Um, Nilesh, mycologists clearly have something against us clinicians within nomenclatures. <laughs> <laughs> that is the new names and then ibrex of fungip and what uh, no it's it's we, we will try our best to learn the new names but um is, is this likely to be the last shift i mean is this now solid molecular diagnostic uh, or solid uh, molecular um phylogenetics or, or or do you think it may change again in the future jeremy you know it's difficult to say i mean i think for the five you know for the five or six common candida species that's probably, you know, now that phylogenetic analysis has been done, I think, you know, those, those fungi are probably accurately placed in their, in their little boxes. Candida auris, though, you know, has five clades, and those five clades behave so completely differently from each other, and I suspect at some point, you know, watch the space, but I think in five to ten years, people are going to start pushing for the or the various clades of candida always to be elevated to species level. Oh, yeah, I, we will we will brace ourselves, but <laughs> but it is it is lovely, and it and it does make the point which you did make that you know these candida species are not necessarily all that closely related. I mean, they're not now not even candida species, but it does reinforce that point. Um, and then a bunch of questions coming in. So um, one of the questions was about the, the diagnostics that you had in terms of things like T2 candida. The sensitivity then in that table and the specificity, is that compared to blood culture positivity? Yes, yes. Um, blood culture positivity, yes, used as the, as the gold standard. Um, and then uh, Ray, Ray Wake uh, asks a question which I had as well, which is about when we're comparing the antifungal drugs in terms of survival benefit, is that just a reflection of uh, resistant isolates being more common in one group and the other? In other words, is it, is it a function of the breadth of the antifungal coverage or is it, or is that true even when you controlled for resistance? So if you took something that was, let's say, susceptible to fluconazole and, a kind of, uh, and mycofungin, was there any residual difference in terms of survival? Right, so you're talking about all those clinical trials, those comparisons, yes. all those antifungal agents. And so they were so, those, anti, those, those trials of antifungal agents were so different, and they were done over different periods of time, over several decades, so over three decades, essentially. And over those three decades, there were, there were ecological changes, you know, things changed. So many more patients had non-albicans um, infections, I think. So it, it's not that simple to compare. Then, you know, I've, I've presented them as apples equals apples, you know, Compare, comparing apples, they should probably be oranges, pineapples and things, because, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think those cohorts are exactly the same. Um, and they were done in, they were not all multi-center trials. So, you know, they may have reflected, you know, the epidemiology in, the, in, in Europe and in the States and Australia, mostly. Yeah, no, thanks. So, I mean, as far as... And so, Jeremy, sorry, sorry, well, just one other thing, just to say that, you know, when you start doing subgroup analyses within these clinical trials, your, your power to find any differences then becomes really um, problematic. But I think, you know, maybe, I don't know, I think that, 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 that um, meta-analysis that was done in 2012 might have adjusted for, for Canada species. I need to go back and look at that, David Andy's paper. Okay, great, thank you. 
Um, and then a couple of questions on treatment. Um, so uh, Colleen Bamford's asking about, could you comment on the need for increased doses of echinocandins with obesity in critically ill patients? Is there such a need? And, and uh, you know, what are your feelings on that? Yeah, so Colleen, that's a really good question. Um, so, you know, I wrote, a, um, I wrote a piece in the, I can't remember, one of the newsletters, uh, a few years ago for one of the pharma company, I can't remember who it, which pharma company it was, but, but it was exactly that question about elevated doses of echinocandins. And I think that, you know, what my take home from that, from the, my, my review at the time was that it, it's probably reasonable in, in certain people, particularly people with, with morbid obesity to, to elevate the, the doses. But I think you know one has to weigh up the the, the benefits versus the um, benefits versus the harms. I think that you know kind of candidates are relatively um, they you know obviously have very few side effects, um, but there are some theoretical concerns around um, elevating the dose. I mean I don't know if that really translates into what happens in vivo. Um, but elevating the dose may potentially um, reduce the antifungal activity. Uh, but I think that the bottom line was, yeah, I think it's reasonable to elevate the dose where you've got problems with volume of distribution, also people who are morbidly obese. Thank you. Um, and then two more quick ones. Uh, so someone asking about how how do you manage some someone who's got a, a catheter tip, a central line catheter tip that's positive for Canada, but with a blood culture that's negative. So obviously you'd remove the line, I assume, but then would you treat it as a full candidemia dose or, or do you, can you shorten that? Right. So, that, I mean, that's, you know, that's... Uh... The problem is the, the sensitivity of blood cultures is not perfect. So you probably want to make sure that the person remains stable. I, I guess if you're in a, in a situation where you can monitor the person really closely um, and you, you can pull out that catheter really quickly and you can monitor that person really carefully, you probably you may be able to get away with no antibiotic treatment. Um, because of course, um, you know, that would be it may just indicate central venous catheter colonization. It, you know, there may not actually be a bloodstream infection. Jeremy, what do you do in your practice? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I, I think it, as you say, the, the, the challenge on both degrees is, is that you don't have the perfect diagnostic. So we know that the, that the you know, the blood cultures are not anywhere close to 100% sensitive, as you, as you rightly said. I mean, it's, you know, it's somewhere between 50 and 70 at most, really. Um, so, I mean, I, I think, as you rightly said, the, the clinical picture is, is guiding here. If someone who's unstable, I think, you know, really deserves the antifungal therapy as if it's a candidemia. Someone who's looking great and, you know, totally fine, uh, you know, is, is someone you may, you may give a shorter duration of treatment for. I must be honest, I always give some, but, but it's, I mean, if the patient's doing great, I would seldom go, go to 14 days. You know, I may give five days or, or for seven days or something. Um, I think there are IDSA guidelines on this, which I'm embarrassed to say I can't recall offhand in terms of the... Neither can I central line catheter, but I think we should check that probably as well and see what they recommend. I, I mean, my kind of general practice is a week if they're looking great, if they're looking unstable to treat as uh, candidemia. Um, and then very last, sorry, Nilesh, we, we're monopolizing your time, apologies, but um, Alicia Glover was asking about, uh, so I may uh, say this wrong, but Candida guillemondii, is that a, uh, so yep, she, that's a right. the brain abscess? Uh, and she's saying, do you have any advice on treatment? <laughs> this is, we're really wow. putting you in the hot seat today. <laughs> Sorry. Right. So, Candida Gilliamondii um, may have elevated the kind of candid MICs. Uh, but I think, Alicia, I think it's, you know, obviously worthwhile doing susceptibility testing. Um, so, was, you know, one needs to find out, you know, was this, was this, Candida species, um, you know, cultured from the from 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 a peripheral site, and you know, imaging of brain ap you know brain abscesses at the same time, or did you find this at the at the site, um, which which of course, um, and then of course, in terms of treatment, um, you want 
you want an agent obviously that penetrates into the into the brain um and so i guess i guess you probably want to use something like amphotericin b but it it would really depend on the it completely depend on the susceptibility of that pathogen hi i'm felicia clauber um, hi we sent it was a, a brain biopsy, a brain biopsy for brain abscess on, on MRI, and we sent it through to NICD. I think it was on PCR. Um, Dr. Christy Esterheis and the histopathologist was also involved. I initially thought the patient had histoplasmosis. Um, but in general, uh, I just wanted to, in retrospect, uh, hear what your um, uh, advice would be on treatment and prognosis wise because the patient did not do well. So what we do, so what was the, what were the underlying problems with this patient, Alicia? Yeah, he had HIV. That's the only thing, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I don't think there's, there's any clear evidence, as far as I've seen, that HIV itself predisposes to invasive disease. Um, uh, but, but anyway, I mean, the, the point is, if, you know, if you've got a disseminated infection that involves the brain parenchyma, you have to obviously treat um, if that's the likeliest pathogen. And like I said, I would, treat with, um, I would treat with an agent that penetrates really well into the, into the brain parenchyma, potentially even with combination treatment. Um, the prognosis in general for fungal brain abscesses is not fantastic. It's generally not great. I mean, I, I don't have a you know specific prognosis, but yeah, generally not very good. All right, thank you. All right, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it there. Just uh, unless there's still some questions popping up in the Q and A box. If you have time, maybe you want to just type them in as we, we we carry on. But you may you may have to go. If so, I will I'll try my best with them as well. Um, but I I want to just pause it then. Thank you very much, Nilesh. This was really one of the best talks on this topic I've ever heard. So that's that's really excellent, and we we're very very grateful for your expertise here. Um, and thank you so much.